My name is David Moorfield. I'm a freelance owner, operator, and DP here in Orlando. And this is one of those rare occasions where you get to level up in your career. And I want to bring you guys in for it. All right, call time's at two and we are 20 minutes early. Just need to find some parking. That's pretty much it. Everyone has their camera and lens assignment at least. Are you sure you want me on sticks and not floating scorpions? I think so, yeah. I just think because of the, the, the issue would be in not a lot of room around the cage. Warfield's gonna have to be everywhere and then Dave's gonna have to be everywhere. I don't want there to be like too many people dancing around. Just that. But that one is like six hundred dollars a year. <laughs> but when but when they're making that when they're making that in there, even better uh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, let me show you what this let me show you what this looks like. Alright, so we're putting this in into weigh in, correct? And into sound and then combat night. Yeah. And then we're gonna do the I'm not going to speak as much as I normally do in my videos because I want you guys to get a raw experience of what this is like. It was very beneficial to me, so I think it'll help a lot of others out there. But I normally shoot on my C70, and that's what I was supposed to shoot this production on. As soon as I arrived, they said, we are covering four main fights. So you will cover the remaining fights on your C70 that will go for social. And then for our fights, here, take this red Komodo. Do you know how to use it? I said, I've played with one once, but I've never used it on a production. And they gave me about a two minute crash course and said, run with it. So that is uh, something that I'm learning for these higher level productions is you don't have to own these tools, but you do need to be familiar with them. And I am so happy that a couple years ago, I spent hours watching red videos because even though I didn't own one, I never had my hands on them. I was looking up at all these red videos and I remember hearing in one of those videos that these lights at the bottom, the bottom left of the screen, if they light up on the bottom, that means your blacks are clipping. And if you light up at the top, that means your highlights are clipping. And that was a massive, massive thing for me to gauge exposure correctly because I asked them about that and they said, yeah, of course. So <laughs> I'm really, really glad I spent this, that time watching YouTube videos um, because I was just going from camera to camera and, and they were shooting on their own reds. There was an FX9, there was an A7S III, there was, uh, I believe this is a Helium, a uh, Dragon, and it was extremely fast paced. But let me give you context to what this project is. So this is the pilot for a docu-series about Florida MMA fighters. And the goal here is to make a killer episode one, send it out to the distributors, the platforms, the channels, whoever, you know, fingers crossed, they're all hoping for Netflix, and then get the rest of the season greenlit. And that way, the rest of the team can come back and continue shooting. And this is a 17 person crew. This is the biggest I've ever been a part of. So there are three producers, there are two DPs, three additional camera ops, I'm the last one. There are first ACs, there are PAs, DITs, everything you would need for a legitimate production. And just to be in this room is something I'm grateful for. I don't know how to get into this room any other way than someone puts your name in the conversation. That's the only way I've found. And that's how I got into this one. So I'm trying to absorb all the information, um, production etiquette, all of that. This is our first DP and his sound guy. And since this is a documentary, they are actively following the characters, the storyline, whatever is happening in front of them, because you don't want to miss. It only happens once and you got to grab it. This is my buddy James Gilbert. He's an amazing photographer and I've shot with him for years. 
but it seems like every time we meet up, he's about to go do something really, really cool. So he is a photographer for Getty Images, and they send him everywhere. The US Open, Golf Tour, Formula One, UFC, anything that you can think of, NASCAR, whatever, he's shot it. And he recently just became a staff photographer for the Jacksonville Jaguars. So I'll put his IG in the description, but he's a super humble dude and his imagery is amazing. Show me the gear, what is this? The R3? So we, got, we got R3, we got the 35 yeah. Prime, because, you know, it's dark in here. And we got another R3, the 85 1.2. Oh my god. Because it's uh, pitch black, so. So I heard reds take a long time to turn on, but what I had to do was, if I knew what the next fight coming up was gonna be shot on the red, then in the fight preceding that, during the last round, I would turn the camera on and let it do its thing. Because it took about 30 seconds. Here's the whole sequence of it turning on, so you can time it if you want to. But uh, you have to be very cautious about when you want to film something. It, it's not a run and gun camera. The C70 can turn on in about three seconds and it saved me so many times how fastly it can start up and be recording. The combating on fighting tonight out of the red corner. Please welcome David Zellner. Yes, you heard that name correctly. David Zellner. That is the fighter in my documentary. So he was not on the list of fighters to cover for this pilot. But something happened. People got injured, fights got rearranged, and when they gave me the sheet of which fighters were covering tonight, boom, his name was circled. I was so happy for him because this is a massive opportunity to have all of these eyes on him while he's gonna be fighting his heart out. So um, my heart is pounding right here. I'm on the Komodo now, and I actually had to move it off my chest because my heart was beating it, vibrating. You can peep his Jaguars hat, but something to mention is James searches for these one-off gigs purely to sharpen his skills. So he offers someone free content in exchange for access into their event, and it's purely a creative exercise. So if he's still doing it, all of us can still be doing that. It doesn't hurt to keep practicing your craft. I asked the DIT if I could film his workstation and he was pretty excited to tell me about the RAID, the card readers, the power inverters on the bottom. He had his whole thing figured out and uh, I learned about this categorizing system. So you put the letter of the camera in the lineup, so A cam, B cam, C cam, and then the number is how many cards you've given them. That's how he keeps track. And my SD cards he hated them because they were so much slower than the red cards. They were taking forever to transfer and they were bottlenecking his workflow. So um, always tell them if, if it's your personal card because they'll offload that first rather than putting it at the end of the queue and making you wait. But this card speed issue is what I'm seeing in the level discrepancy of where I'm at and where these people are at. So when I say, oh, I wonder if I should get a C70 or a FX3. Those are all the same level. It's just personal preference. It's only when it comes to this level where certain things are required, like R3D files or extremely fast media cards. These are the types of things that keep the workflow moving efficiently. And anything beyond that is just personal preference. And these people own their cameras but you don't have to, you can rent. Usually the production can, has a budget to rent. 
It's a little cheaper to get an owner hop, but you know, I didn't own the red Komodo and I worked on this one fine. So uh, this is the end of the night uh, wrap up team meeting. And I heard them say, all right, we're gonna go. We have one more OTF. And I looked around and I said, what's an OTF? And they said on the fly. So that just meant we got one more thing to film and then we can leave. We were slated to leave at 3 a.m. But we actually left here at like one, so not too bad. Um, then head back to the hotel, drop James off, and at this point I was exhausted. Next morning I just met with the crew one last time. They said if you want to get any of the red footage, do it now. So grabbed a couple clips and was able to just have a couple more conversations, which is so valuable. Um, another producer asked for my phone number. He um, asked for the link to my documentary because uh, when my buddy was fighting, I let him know, oh, I just made a documentary on him. So he goes, cool, send me the link, let's get your number. And uh, who knows what that'll turn into. I also found out a little bit more of how I got put into this position. So I originally followed that fighter and I did a passion project free documentary and it allowed me access to get into this MMA promotion, the, the regional MMA promotion. They saw my documentary, said, great job, we'd like to hire you for some of our projects. So now you're making a little bit of money. Not a lot, but you're making connections and you're making a little bit of money. Did that for about seven fights or so, and then when this out of town production came here, they said, we need some, uh, some hands, some local hires. And I was introduced into there because of being familiar uh, with the right people, doing a good job on those smaller experiences. And um, they said I took creative direction well. So this one has led to the biggest connection of my career. But now I'm getting back to Orlando and I'm doing a site visit for the biggest budget job of my career. So this one has nothing to do with uh, my typical filmmaking stuff. It's a 12 day time lapse project. That's gonna be a, a, whole, a whole other thing, but still the cinematography knowledge and more so the business acumen knowledge is, is uh, playable to any circumstance, any situation. It all has a crossover. Tomorrow, call time is 6 a.m. and 12-day uh, time lapse.